All right, here we go. We're late. Ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Welcome to Simple True Church. Well, we're going to keep it simple, yeah, where the donuts are fl fresh and the coffee's hot. And the truth is simple. Here we go. Got a few announcements this morning. Hope you guys had a good week. Continue to pray for rain. Ah, oh, I guess, well, the, the river fire is 100% contained now. Yay. Yeah. I have a brand new appreciation for uh, firefighters. And uh, unbelievable. It's a young man's job. <laughs> running up and down those hills like mountain goats. But they were amazing. And uh, I got to work with uh, captains from, from Napa, Sonoma, from Riverside, and from uh, Amador, and then one from uh, El Dorado Hills. Great guys, yeah. But it's good to be off that fire and good to be here this morning. So... Uh, we, I was going through, you know, how you, how you get featured photos of the day. So that was a featured photo of the day from a few years ago. So Lori posted that, I guess, on Facebook. And thank you, firefighters. We're praying for you. So that, that uh, came in handy. And uh, we'll continue to pray for them. They're still up there fighting the fight on those uh, Dixie fires and several other fires. and So we'll pray for them. And... If you've been around Lori and I for any time, or at least for more than two years, you know that for years, Lori's folks sent us to Hawaii. And, and they bought a place in the Pili so, my, so our kids could have good vacation memories. That's what her dad says. I'm going to buy a, a, a condo. And he bought it. It wasn't a timeshare. He bought a condo right on the ocean, but it was... Dirt cheap back then. I think he paid like $35,000 for it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, they couldn't even build that condo now because of the rest uh, setback restrictions and stuff. But we don't go there anymore. But they sent us over there, and, and this is how it works. They send us, they pay for everything, that rental car, the flights, and then they give us spending money. So grandma turns 90 in, uh, in September. And so she goes, hey, we're going to Maui for my 90th. So we're all set to go. We're going to be gone 10 days. Pastor Tommy's going to be at the helm. Next week, uh, Nick Sodavilla, Sodavilla, he's coming next week. He's been here before, and when he was here last time, you guys loved him. And the sound dude loved him. He, he's amazing. He's great. He's coming from uh, our son Christopher's church from uh, River City. And so he's going to lead worship next week. And then we'll have Rick and, and uh, Christine Sween the following week, which would be awesome. So uh, Lori and I be over there. And uh, we have to go. And... Uh, yeah, you pray for us. I'll tell you what, every time, we didn't go last year, obviously, but every time we go, I'm thinking, well, we got to go again? No, I'm serious. So, so, well, we still aren't sure that we get to go, so we have to find out if our COVID tests come back negative, and then, uh, and then we get to go. So, but that's what it looks, that's the lineup, just in case, in case we're not here next Sunday. That's where we are. And then, uh, let's see, what else is going on? I, anybody in here go to the fair? Uh, okay, you guys are a lot braver than I am. 
Wow. Now, I've just been too busy. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that's a good reason not to go to the fair. I was thinking John Clausen. I worked the bank with Gary Kinney for years. We worked the uh, money guard for years. And I was just thanking God. <laughs> wow, I'm glad we're not doing that. That's, you know, you stay till 1 o'clock in the morning. And yeah, anyway. And, and you know, no uh, pressure or anything. So uh, that part was good. Well, anyway, I hope you had a, a uh, corn dog. So uh, what else is going on? Prayer request. Remember, you can visit our website, see what's going on. Prayer request, request forms are in the back. Or, again, you guys know the drill. You can uh, call us or text us anytime to get on the uh, prayer chain and have us pray with you. And then uh, you can see what's going on with women's morning prayer on Tuesdays and women's Bible studies and men's Bible studies. You can, you can uh, get hooked up with that. And then uh, prayer request. Uh, John and I worked with this guy. He's a dear friend of ours. And uh, his 36-year-old stepdaughter, her mother was over there at her house for on her birthday, and they sat down to uh, eat lunch, and she dropped dead. And, uh, and so she had COVID in early, late May, early June. Okay, so when our buddy, because he worked at the sheriff's office with us, when our buddy called the uh, medical examiner, they said, oh, well, her body already went over to uh, the mortuary. And he says, really, what's the cause of death? COVID? Really? So did somebody do a COVID test on her? No. And you just automatically, because, what makes you think she died from COVID? Well, because she had it two, two, uh, two months ago. Well, she's over that. She was over that. And so you put her down that she's uh, died from COVID? That's unacceptable. And, and the medical examiner says, that's just the way we do it now. So anyway, he got her body back. And it's at the, she's at the medical examiner's, and they're doing a, a post-mortem autopsy. And uh, so they're going to see what, what she really died from. And, uh, but we need to pray for he and uh, his bride. I've talked to him several times on the phone, and... and uh, I did a, like a little mini. In fact, she texted me. She said, thanks for the personal mini sermon. Because I was talking to her, and I basically told her the memorial service, you know, about where daughter is. And uh, it's tough. So, I mean, you know. So we'll just uh, pray for them. And then we'll pray for uh, Tita Fowler's mother. She has pancreatic cancer, and she's going to be needing surgery and and uh, chemo, and she knows the Lord. So we'll pray for her. And then uh, another good friend of ours that I worked with, with uh, Kloss and Jeff Glover, his sister's 42-year-old stepson is in ICU in Oklahoma with a post-COVID respiratory condition, heavily sedated. So we'll pray for him, Jason. And then Chase Milligan, we've been praying for him. And remember, he had that, uh, was going in for the surgery, and that surgery went really well. And uh, he has a trach, but he, they're able to put something near him to where they can hear him. I don't know if it's one of those, whatever, that they can hear him talk. But uh, he asked what happened to him and uh, how bad is he burned. And uh, he was pointing to his, to his hand. And so he's, he's getting more, more with it, uh, you know, I guess less sedated. And so uh, this is from, uh, from his mom, it sa- and it says, by the way, the surgery on his face went really well. And doctor said, one more graft surgery only, scheduled for the 30th tentative. Please pray that they can put the bone flap back at, at the same time. If that happens, we will go to Shriners for recovery, which would be another miracle. So praise God for that. That's awesome. And we'll continue to pray for Chase as uh, he's recovering. It's a miracle that he's alive and it's a miracle that he's recovering. So thank you, Lord, for that. 
And then continue to pray for Jeff Harder's aunt, BJ. She fell. She's hospitalized. She's sent home. And uh, it says we, she will not be with us much longer. She's a believer. Pray she has peace, comfort for the family as well. And, and uh, I guess Pat Feltz is doing better. I heard she's home. So, and it's good to see several people in here that have been uh, sick recently. And uh, God's good. Continue to pray for those that are sick right now that we know. And uh, they're doing okay. They're hanging in there. They're in the fight. And so we continue to pray for Gail Tanquery as well, who's been battling cancer for several years now. And uh, Jamie Rose, who has ALS. And then our uh, servicemen and women, it's always an honor to be able to pray for them and uh, pray that they remain out of harm's way and that God would continue to bless them and bless their families for the sacrifices they make. While that's scrolling, does anybody else have a prayer request? Nancy. Yeah. I was thinking of them when I said, we're going to pray for people that we know are sick, huh? Yeah. Pray for them. Yes, sir. Oh, really? I heard they're sending some troops over to Afghanistan. So Cutter is one of them and his bride. Wow. So we pray for them. They were, they, uh, Cutter was in Tommy and I's junior high class. Know his family and him. So we'll pray for them as well. Yeah, well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we can come here this morning. And Lord, we pray that for rain. Lord, we're thankful that your hand was upon especially this river fire, that you changed the course of that fire by changing the course of the wind, and you basically burned that fire into into itself. And you helped the firefighters, but we know it was you. And so we're thankful for that. And, Lord, we just pray for rain, lots of rain. I know, you know, naysayers would say it's August and it never rains in August. But we know that you're the keeper of the rain. You're the rain maker. And so we just pray for that. And we ask that in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we're thankful for our first responders and those who serve our country. And we pray that you would keep them out of harm's way, that you would bless them for their sacrifices, bless their families. And Lord, we're thankful. We're thankful that we meet in a public school because of sacrifices that men and women have made on our behalf for our freedom. And so, Lord, we don't want to ever take that for granted. And, Lord, we pray for those that are in power that call the shots again, that you would give them wisdom, that you would uh, give them humility, Lord, that you would uh, allow them to make good decisions. And we pray that as well. And, Lord, we pray for those that have lost loved ones. There's several in this room. There's uh, thinking about uh, Joe and Debbie as well. And we just ask in the name of Jesus to wrap your arms around them. Lord, Lord, when they get hammered by those waves of sorrows like sea billows roll, Lord, that, that they would really sense your presence, that, that they would know, and they would, they, would, they would have sorrow with hope. Lord, the hope that they have in Jesus. And, Lord, we pray again for those that are sick among us. We're thankful for what's going on with Chase Milligan and pray that you continue to uh, give the doctors wisdom and that you would heal him. Lord, we pray for uh, Bill as he goes in for uh, back surgery this week. We just ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would give those doctors wisdom. Lord, that they, they would pull off a back surgery better than they've ever pulled one off. And, Lord, that you would... Uh, Cause Bill to heal quicker than expected. 
pray you'd be with Julia, Lord, and, and you'd give them both peace. And Lord, I uh, pray for those that are sick among us. And I just ask you in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would heal them. Lord, you're bigger than COVID, ALS, cancer, uh, vaccine side effects. You're bigger than all of that. And Lord, we know you're the great physician. We, you've proved that. And so we just ask for, one, is to draw, draw them to you like they've never been drawn to you before. And two, is to, to Lord, I pray that you would just show off how amazing you are, and that we'd be able to brag about that. And so we promise to give you all the praise and the glory. So we pray that you would touch them and you would heal them in Jesus' name. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's worship. Let's stand.
regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen.
Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it, seal it for Thy courts above. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Prone to wander. Lord, that's Paul the Apostle knows that well, and he breaks that down to the folks in Thessalonica. They're just like us. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would, Holy Spirit, teach us this morning, you'd speak to our hearts, and this would be applicable to each and every one of us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Right on, you uh, youth, you can youth on out of here. Pastor Tommy's back there, and... and they got things dialed in for youth ministry. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Thessalonians 2. Start out with 2.17, the heart of a shepherd. You know, the, as uh, Tommy goes through the I am's, and, and he went through the I am of the good shepherd, you can, you're going to see right here how that lines up with, with Paul the apostle. Obviously, God changed his heart. Jesus changed his heart because he changed his want to's because he didn't want to do this. Now he wants to do this. That's his passion. And so we're going to see that here, the first Thessalonians. It's a great testimony of a shepherd's love right here in this passage. You know, the church family, this church family, the, the big church family, the Christian church family, and uh, this goes right along with this and that God, God the Father is, is the great shepherd and it's encouraged, it's really encouraging to know that the great shepherd is one who loves us. When everything else has fallen down around our ears, we know that God's in control and that he loves us. Check this out in Matthew 12, 47 through 49. It says, while he, while Jesus was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So that's a pretty good indication right there that a spiritual tie, that the ties that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ, is, it's, it's as strong and as, as deep as, as a family tie oftentimes more so than our own family members because we become members of the family spiritually. And Paul pours out the, his shepherd's heart of concern for these new Christians. They're baby Christians, and he had to leave them behind. They had to get out of Thessalonica. And, and we can't read this letter without sensing the, the kindness of his heart and the, and the depth of his love. So in our text this morning, 1 Thessalonians 217 we'll start there he says but since we were torn away from you brothers for a short time in person not in heart we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you I Paul again and again but Satan hindered us for what is our hope of joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming is it not you for you are our glory and joy and that just just radiates that you know that hey that those are his kids his spiritual kids and and at the at the time this letter was written he was ministering alone in the city of Corinth he was feeling the loneliness of that moment where he had to get out of dodge and then He's thinking about what, what he left behind and, and how they're doing. You know, already in this chapter, we've seen three sources of opposition to Paul. In verse 2, opposition from the state. In verse 14, opposition from society. And here in verse 18, opposition from Satan. And it looks like three enemies, but it's, it's not. It's really one. 
Other scriptures indicate that the state and, and society, they're often the channels of Satan's attempts to obstruct and stop the spread of the gospel, stop the spread of the good news. That's what Paul was encountering here. And we've all experienced frustrating times in our own lives when again and again we've tried to do the next right thing. We tried to do something right. We found it tough. It's like, man, it's really hard to do the right thing. And then we meet opposition and obstacles, perhaps even from our own family members. And that's satanic oppression. We see a lot of satanic oppression right now. Right now. You know, they... The oppression that tries to twist our way of thinking, tries to get us to think something else, and then it stir up opposition and plant obstacles in our path. Satan has a clever ability to work through people to stir things up. And the Bible is the only book that, ex it, that, that explains the persistence and, and hate of evil. Jesus told us in John 8, 44. He says, you are... You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character because he is a liar and the father of all lies. So he deceives, Satan deceives, and Satan kills and, and the satanic mind is responsible for murderous violence. I mean, you, every day you can read something in there that is just straight up satanic. You know, you read about people mass murdering or doing, you know, crazy things. And you know it's straight from the pit of hell. And the widespread deceit, you know, and the false philosophies that we're confronted with today. Paul himself tells us in Ephesians 6.12... For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You know, you can't find another book that, that tells us that it's not the people who are a problem. There's no other book that tells us that. It's, it's the spiritual forces of evil that prevail in this world. I mean, you, you, you see how Satan is prevailing in this world and, and that he has a lot of puppets. Satan's got a lot of puppets, and, and they just do whatever Satan, they, and they're ignorant. They don't have a clue. They just, they just go along with it because Satan's controlling that. He prevails in the world. And Paul suggests in his letters that there's three things that we need to know about Satan's opposition. First, and this is probably the most important, it's permitted by God. God allows it. God allows satanic oppression. Book of Job says that Satan had to come to God and get permission, that he, get permission from him that he would be able to afflict Job and afflict Job's body. Job lost everything. He lost his family, lost his home, lost his wealth, and he suffered from those terrible boils that covered his whole body. But God allowed it. At the end of the book reveals, you know, what was accomplished by the suffering, but it was all hidden. It was all hidden to uh, Job when, that, when it was going on. So, too, it is hidden from us. And we look at things and go, what, Lord, why? Why? How long will the wicked prosper? I think it's like Psalm 73, the psalmist says that. Lord, God, how long will the wicked prosper? And then you read the whole thing, and then down at the bottom it says, and then I saw their end. The Bible reveals there's a power of evil at work. There, there are demonic beings, master manipulators. You know, and they're able to lead people about. You know, they just lead them. They put thoughts in their minds, planting obstacles in the path of the gospel. We're just going to, don't believe that. Don't believe that. It ain't real. Jesus isn't real. Don't believe that. The second fact that we must remember is that God permits this because these are things that he uses. God uses these things. Opposition is a method of, of training. Affliction, suffering, pain, and heartache are often God's ways of getting our attention. And we know that. Many of us have gone through that. You know, we paid, and I can speak for myself, we paid little attention to him until we suffered 
a time of great heartache. And then it's like, oh my, okay, you have my attention. Now what do you want me to do? But then we begin to hear. That's when we begin to hear that, you know, that what he was saying to us. And God uses opposition to train us. And not only that, it gives us the opportunity to overcome trouble. We see God's work in our own lives and in other people's lives to, to rise above it. And then the third thing, as it's made clear in this passage, is the emphasis on the value of these believers to Paul. Verses 19 and 20 in our text. He says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are the glory, are our glory and joy. So whatever else those words mean, they're saying that Paul considered the spiritual maturing of these believers in Thessalonica and other places his most important work. You know, he's saying, hey, I've invested my life in you. I've, I've, I'm sacrificing my life for you. I'm investing in you, and I'm investing for you to grow and, and to mature. I'm in, investing for you to be whole people in Christ. And that's the most important thing in the world. When Jesus comes... Paul says, hey, I want to glow with pride that you've achieved these changes in your life and and, and you you see how God has worked in and through you and you've matured. Check this out. J.I. Packer, uh, he was born the 22nd of July in 1926 and he just died last, last summer, July 17th, 2020. He's an English-born Canadian evangelical theologian, and he's best known for his best-selling book, Knowing God, if you can get it on uh, wherever you want to get it. But it's a great book to read, Knowing God by J.I. Packer. It was written in 1973. And he's also known as he was one of the editors of the English Standard Version of the Bible that we use. So he's a theologian. And he quotes a psychologist on the six marks of maturity. Check this out. The first mark of maturity is the ability to deal constructively with reality, to face facts, to not cover up reality or call it something else, but to deal with it as it is. Mature people don't kid themselves. The second mark is adapting quickly to change. Immature people resist change. It makes them nervous. But the mark of maturity is to adapt to change because change is inevitable. The third mark is freedom from the symptoms of tension and anxiety. The the worried look, the frown, the ulcers, the palpitations of the heart all come because we're upset, anxious, and worried. Maturing means that we've begun to see that God is in control. He's in control of this world. He's working out purposes that we don't always understand, but we accept that. He's sovereign. He's in control. He will take us through deep water, not to drown us, but to get us to the other side. Maturity means that we're learning to trust. Fourth, it means to be satisfied more with giving than receiving. That's a sign that we're growing up. We are discovering the true values of life. The fifth mark is to relate to others with consistency, to let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, helpfulness and and mutual satisfaction. Maturity is learning to get along with other people, to be a help, not a hindrance, to contribute to the solution and not always to be a part of the problem. And then finally, maturity is controlling and redirecting anger to constructive ends. Maturity is the ability to use the adrenaline that anger creates, not to lose our temper and add to the problem, but to correct the situation or to contribute to changing the nature of the difficulty. That is maturing, and that's what Paul's talking about here. That's what Paul is longing for these believers in Thessalonica. As this passage right here, it makes clear his concern involved him because he's got a solid commitment. He is in. He's all in. Back to our text, 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 1 through 5. He says, because of that, because of 
what I just said in, in chapter 2. He says, therefore, when, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that, that we were to suffer affliction just as, as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I, I, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. So twice in this, in this section, Paul says that they, 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 uh, there came a time in Athens that they could, they could bear it no longer. And that doesn't mean that he was anxious or, or, or fearful, but he hadn't heard from them. He hadn't heard from them for, for, for so long that he had to find out what was going on in Thessalonica. So he decided to send Timothy. And, you know, and that was taken away from him. Because Timothy was, was his go-to guy. Timothy, you know, was his partner. And so he's going to cut Timothy loose to go to them while he remained alone in Athens. And, and then he went over to Corinth. And so he had to face the city by himself. But he was willing to do that in order to check on the Thessal Thessalonian believers to see how they're doing, to see if they're growing in their faith. And so he had three things in mind. He tells us first in, ver in verse 2b, to establish and exhort you in your faith. So he sends Timothy to, to teach them the great realities that their faith rested upon, the, the coming of Jesus, his, his life, his, his ministry, his death on the cross, his resurrection, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so, and, and so the availability to them of this new resource in God that the world wouldn't know anything else about. The world wouldn't know anything about it. The Thessalonians needed to be established in that truth. That's what Timothy's mission was. And then secondly in verse 3, that no one be moved by these afflictions. They needed to be exhorted to stand fast. When there's craziness going on in your life, craziness going on in the world, stand fast in who you are in Christ. Don't panic when things get tough. They should never forget that suffering and affliction can be overcome. They had a resource to lean upon then, and, and, and they didn't have that before. They're new creations in Christ. Now they have this resource. They have the Holy Spirit, so they, they don't have to fear God would take them through everything, and then he would use it for their benefit. And Paul had already laid the foundation for this when he, when he was with them. He taught them that the human race w was defiled with what the Bible calls sin. We live in a fallen world. We're going to expect affliction. We can expect satanic oppression. And sin is a problem that arises from within, within us. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 15 Starting in verse 19, he says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, Jesus says. Sin is an internal contamination. He says it's out of our heart. Remember out of the, the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks? It's an internal contamination which we inherited. And the bad news that comes with that is in Romans Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Pain, suffering, anguish, isolation, those are all forms of death. Those are forms of spiritual death. Pain, suffering, anguish, isolation, forms of death, that's bad news. But with it always comes good news. For the wages of sin is death. You continue to read on the rest of that verse, 6, 23 in Romans. But the gift of, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we can't avoid, we can't avoid painful results of our sinful choices. We got to suffer the consequences of, of choices that we make. But in that, when we repent, we can find love, joy, and peace even while we're working through our just rewards, our consequences. So we're going to 
suffer the consequences of our action, but we can learn through that and come out the other end. That's the good news. And that's what Paul had taught the Thessalonians. And that's what Timothy was sent there to remind them of. So they could remain steadfast when they got hammered by afflictions. And then the third reason Paul sent Timothy was that he himself needed to know what was going on. So Timothy could bring back the word. And and now he had returned, and he had such a good report that Paul was filled with joy. He's tickled pink, starting in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 9. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us, as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in, in all our distress and affliction, we have been con- comforted about, about you through, through your faith. Because now we live, if you are standing fast in the Lord, because what thanksgiving can be returned to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake, before, before our God. So Paul's relieved that his work wasn't in vain. Paul's relieved that, hey, man, they're still standing fast. They're still in the fight. It's, it's, it's solid and sure. Their faith was intact. Their love was evident. And best of all, their trust in the Lord was secure. They were still trusting in the Lord. The, and, and plus, they had good memories of Paul, and they longed to see him. So he's filled with thankfulness and joy for this good news. And that is always the effect upon a father's heart. A spiritual father or, or you know, or, a, or a, a father is when you receive good reports that your children are in the faith. You know, it, it's how uh, the apostle John felt as he tells us in, in his third letter, in thir- uh, 3 John, 3 John 1, 4. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear my children are walking in the truth. That's what, Paul's, that's what Paul's feeling. He doesn't have it more greater joy than feel, that feeling as, as uh, Timothy reports the trials and the testing in, in uh, Thessalonica. And then Paul closes this section with a declaration of how to pray in situations like this. Verses 10 through 13 in 1 Thessalonians 3. He says, we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that we may establish, that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and, and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. In, in, in a parallel passage, in, in see, let's see what Paul says to the Romans in Romans 8, 26 through 28. He says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So that's right there is a great example of how the Spirit helped Paul pray for exactly what these people needed. You don't know what the, exactly what people need, but the Holy Spirit can help you pray for exactly what they need. There's three things about prayer in in these verses. In verse 10, it says, we pray most earnestly. He didn't say, I prayed, God, bless my friends in Thessalonica. Bless them. Paul prays earnestly, it says. He thinks about those people. He thinks about what they're going through, okay? He puts the problem before God, and he reminds God of his own promises, And then he takes time to think deeply about their needs, and then he prays often. The second thing is he prays often. He prays day and night, he says, morning and evening. 
while he's working on tents, whatever he's doing, that they come to his mind and he prays to them. His lips are moving. Prayer, you know, they're, they're, the prayer is coming from his heart. And he's concerned for these people. And they aren't often out of his thoughts whenever he thinks about them. That's what he talks about, praying without ceasing. It's, I remember a guy, uh, John Corson, saying that's like when you have that little tickle cough. Not now, but you don't want tickle coughs. But we had a little tickle cough, you know, and it, it just reminds you. You know, it's like when you're fasting, that hunger pang reminds you. Why do I have a hunger pang? Oh, that's right, I'm praying. I'm praying for somebody, fasting and praying. So that's, it's going through him. He's so concerned. They're always on his mind. He's praying. And finally, he prays specifically. You know, he has some very definite things to ask for. Five of them, actually, is what he lists. In verse 10b, that we may see you face to face. Okay, he wanted to get back to Thessalonica again and, and have the joy of seeing his dear friends, seeing his family. And so he lays that request out before the Lord. And second, he wanted to minister further to them in verse 10c and supply what is lacking in your faith. He wanted to continue to teach them. And they needed to know more about the Christian view and what was going on in the world and around them and how that applied to their life. And when we understand how, how to look at the events in our lives the way that the Word of God does, we spend time and, and, and we listen to what the Word of God is saying to us. I'm telling you, if you didn't hear, I think it was Monday, Alistair Begg, go back and listen to Alistair Begg. He's, he's a brilliant expositor. He talks about what's really going on in this world as it applies to the Bible. But when we do that, what happens is, Things become, we see things that realistic. We get the realistic view of what's really going on. All the confusion and illusion, they disappear and we start seeing things the way things really are. Paul wanted to open their eyes to further truths from God. And then he prayed to overcome satanic obstruction in verse 11. He says, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. You know, we can find it difficult to get to where we want to go. We can do that. And so here's how to pray. Hey, Lord, open some doors that need to be open. Slam shut some doors that don't need to be open because I don't even want to go there. But if you need me to go someplace and, I, and this is the way you want me to go, then I need you to open those doors. Open the way, either physically or spiritual. And it's to the goal that God has in mind for us. And then Jesus said in Matthew 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, verse 7, he said, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. That's how Paul prayed. He knocked on this closed door, asking that he might go back to Thessalonica. And then we read in, in accounts later that God answered that prayer. He opened the door, and Paul was able to go back. So we know God answers prayer. And then fourth, he prayed in verse 12, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for, and for all as we do for you. So according to the New Testament, this is the mark of a successful church. The mark of a successful church is in how big a church is, Right? Or, or how famous a church is. That's not the mark of a, of a successful church. The New Testament success is gauged by how people learn to love one another. By people spending time in the word and people learn to love one another. They forgive one another. They actually listen to one another. They support and pray for one another. And they reach out to those in need around them. That is what Paul prayed for the Thessalonians. And I'm telling you, you know, you guys have been around here long enough to know that is simple true church in this community. That is it. That's, a, that's how you can tell success in a church. It's, it's wonderful. And then finally he prays that, that they might continue to live righteously until the Lord comes in verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. You know, if you think about it, and I think about this a lot, I do a lot of memorial services. I deal with 
a lot of people that go home to be with Jesus. You know, the coming of Jesus is no further away from us than it was for those believers in Thessalonica. It's no further away than the end of our lives. You know, if, we, if, we don't, if we're gone before the second coming, then we've already experienced that. The, then we've experienced the coming of Jesus because that's what he promised in John 14. After he goes and prepares a place for you or us, and then he says, I'm going to come and take you unto myself. So it's like a little, I mean, if we could wrap our brains around time and, know, you know, and, and time being different than, than, than our time, they live outside of 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I can't wrap my brain around it, but I know this. If Jesus said he's going to come and take us unto himself, then it's like a, a mini rapture. When we pass away, that's how far away it is for us. If we know Jesus when we die, he comes for us. And because of that, Paul's praying that the rest of their lives might be marked by blameless living. And that doesn't mean sinless. We've already talked about that several times. We've already seen that in this letter. It doesn't mean sinless. We're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. We're going to be sinners until we're glorified. We're in a sanctification process. Blameless means, you know what it means? It means we're dealing with what's wrong and we're not covering it up or pretending that it wasn't there. That we're going to deal with it. They dealt with it in their own hearts with the spiritual resources that God provides. And that's, you know, that if, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to Forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And then they're en enabled to turn from evil and walk closer and closer to God. We've, we've all experienced that in our lives in one way or the other. So Paul knew that Jesus will someday enter this world of time on this side of heaven. That he's coming back again. And the scripture antis anticipates it. There's a good possibility that it's close right now. I mean, we talk about it all the time, different people. Yeah. I have people text me, do you think Jesus is coming soon? Maybe today. He's coming soon. He is. It's close. I mean, we know it's a lot, obviously, 2,000 years closer than it was in Thessalonica. But it's, it's a good possibility that it's close now. It could, it could happen before the end of this year. You know, it's no, but... But here, seriously, if you think about it, it's no further away than our personal death. And that's in our future. Hopefully not in our near future. But it's no further away than that. But it may be even sooner than that if God steps in. That's what we all hope for, right? Paul hopes that all believers will live in the expectation that the Lord's coming will find us living the way we ought to live. You know, that, that if Jesus walked in right now, we wouldn't have any issues. We wouldn't even be embarrassed. We might be embarrassed about our past, but we wouldn't be embarrassed about who we are today in Christ. Most Christians pray that God will prevent things from happening. You know, whether it be injury or death or suffering or heartache. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there's people that teach us that we have the right to be kept from all that trouble. That we have a right to that. Like we deserve more than that. But the New Testament shows us that afflictions are needed in our lives. God does some things. You know, he does grant our requests. He answers our prayers. Sometimes he removes those problems. And we praise God for that. And it's not wrong to pray for that either. You know, some people, that I've been told lots of times that, oh, I don't pray for myself. You know, because that's selfish. I, I pray for other people. Man, I'll tell you, I pray for myself. I need all the prayer I can get, right? It's not wrong to pray for that. But we also have to understand that he has the perfect uh, freedom to say no. But what he tells us to pray for is, is not that these things be prevented, but how he's going to use them in our lives. It's like, okay, we're going through this right now, Lord. Could you reveal to us how you're going to use this in our lives? How... How are you going to make me stronger? How are you going to be able to use this? You remember in the week before Jesus was crucified, he said to Peter, remember his special apostle? He, he says in Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. 
But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus didn't pray, hey, don't let it happen. Satan wants to sift you like wheat. But he didn't pray, don't let it happen. Stop Satan from getting a hold of him. What he said was, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And he said that, you know, he said that before the night when, when Peter denied him. That denial was Satan sifting him. But Jesus prayed, hey, Father, though Peter must go through the anguish and he's going to go through this heartache and embarrassment, I pray that when it happens, and it's going to happen, his faith will hold firm, that you would take him through and use it because all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. He loved the Lord. Use it. And, and we know, history tells us, we know the rest of the story. He was used mightily. The church was built on that rock. And this is what our prayer ought to look like. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. Heartbreak, tragedy, joy, glory. But whatever happened, let's pray that it deepens our faith, that it draws us closer to God, that we know that we know, that we know where we're going and who we're going with, that all this other stuff's going crazy in this world. We know that we are secure on where we're going and who we're going with. We have that. And so what happens is that deepens our faith. It increases our love. It opens blinded eyes to the truth, to reality. We, we actually have discernment. And the result, you know, is spiritual stability in this troubled, unsettled world that we live in. And that's what we want. We want stability. I'll close with this. It's, a, it's a, another Alan Redpath quote. Brilliant. He said, there is nothing... No circumstance, no trouble, no testing that can ever touch me until, first of all, it has gone past God and past Christ right through to me. If it has come that far, it has come with a great purpose, which I may not understand at the moment. But as I refuse to become panicky, as I lift my eyes to him and accept it as coming from the throne of God for some great purpose of blessing, to my own heart, no sorrow will ever disturb me. No circumstance will cause me to fret. For I shall rest in the joy of what my Lord is. And that is the rest of victory. Alan Redpath. Man, I can, re I can remember hearing my dad singing so off key at the top of his lungs, driving down the road in a 54 Chevy station wagon with no air conditioning and seven kids in the car, no seat belts. They're all under the seat. What are those for, Dad? I don't know. But he's singing, Victory in Jesus. <laughs> Victory in Jesus, my Savior. Unbelievable. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Paul the Apostle. Thank you for the example that he gives us as a, a good shepherd that he was taught by you. And Lord, I just pray that these things will ring to, uh, true to us as, as we want to be more like Jesus. We want to draw closer to our shepherd. We know his voice. And Lord, I pray that especially in times of craziness and affliction the craziness in the world. Lord, I pray for people that, that uh, you would give them wisdom and discernment as, as they're getting threatened to lose their jobs. Lord, I pray that, that uh, definitely that you would give them strength, that they would stand firm. Lord, I pray in this whole craziness that's going on and we don't even have a clue i mean we have a clue but lord we just pray we know that you know and so lord we pray that that uh
that you would bind the enemy. You would bind Satan, who is just straight up having a heyday. And, Lord, that you would protect your church. Lord, that you would protect these, your believers, your family, as the good shepherd. Lord, that you would protect them. And, Lord, that you would that they would trust in you with all their hearts. They would lean not on their own understanding in all of their ways, in every one of their ways, in all of their ways, they would acknowledge you and you promise to direct their paths. So we pray that. We're gonna hold on to that. You promise to direct their paths. So I pray that for all of us. We would trust in you with all our hearts. We're not going to lean on our own understanding because we get all sideways. We're just going to stand firm and wait for you to direct our paths. And Lord, I just pray you need to, that you would open the doors that need to be open, slam shut the ones that need to be slammed shut in all of our lives. There's some crazy stuff going on, Lord. And so we reach out to you and we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Now it is well I'm walking in freedom For God 
Amen. Amen. Boy, we have that going for us, which is nice. Man, God's good. Hey, if you need anything this week, get a hold of us. Let us know. If you need uh, uh, a religious exemption for your, for your work, we have some that uh, a good friend of ours sent us from God Speak, and Pastor Jeff would be happy to sign those. So uh, I don't know if they'll work, but they have worked with a couple places down south in Southern California. Anyway, God bless you guys, and uh, have a great week. And go back and read that little section right there, because it was full of a lot of stuff that I never saw before. And uh, stack chairs, please. Oh, and aloha. We'll see you. We'll see you in a couple weeks. <laughs>